Welcome to this rapid revision video on medieval treatments. Just as when we looked at the causes that people believed in medieval times, we can split this between the supernatural and the natural. Because it makes sense that just as medieval theories about the cause of disease were divided between the supernatural and the natural, so were the corresponding treatments. A reminder that supernatural here means literally beyond nature. These theories are often spiritual or religious and they rely on an element of faith. Natural ideas, on the other hand, might simply be common sense, but these ideas were based upon what could be observed in the real world. They're often more scientific, but they're not always correct. So if the cause was believed to be supernatural, the treatment usually was too, and the same applied with natural theories as well. So look out for the spiritual in what we're looking at here. Firstly, some examples of religious and spiritual treatments. There's going to be quite a lot of information that appears here, so at some point you might want to pause it and start making some notes, but I'll leave that up to you. God's actions and punishments are often used to explain misfortune, including disease. Some religious actions were intended to prevent disease, but we will focus here on the treatments. Prayer. This was usually done through the priest or by praying to a particular saint for salvation. Prayers were said by the sick and by others for the sick. Some diseases had a particular saint associated with them. E.g. St. Valentine was considered a patron saint of both epilepsy and the plague, so people suffering from those afflictions might well pray to St. Valentine. Also, confessing sins. This was done to try and gain God's forgiveness, and therefore the removal of the illness, the idea being that God was punishing them with that illness. And then there's pilgrimage. The sick might embark on a difficult religious journey to the shrine of a saint, particularly one associated with the disease. This might include sacred waters. A holy well in Canterbury was believed to cure skin diseases, for example, and it was often visited by those on pilgrimage to the shrine of St Thomas Becket at Canterbury. But there were many preventative measures too, which we'll cover on another time. One thing to bear in mind, though, with religious ideas at the time, is sometimes people actually felt that they shouldn't be fighting the disease as it was part of God's plan, and so God would either make them better or not. Now let's have a look at some natural treatments. Just as before, there's going to be quite a lot of information here, so again, you might want to pause it at various points to make some notes. Natural or rational cures tended to focus on treating the symptom rather than the disease itself. That kind of thinking came later. This might have made people feel better, but it was less likely to actually cure them of the disease. The treatments available depended on what could be afforded by the patient, and we'll cover medieval healers in detail another time, but in brief, physicians were the most expensive. Physicians or doctors would normally aim to use Hippocratic ideas to diagnose and treat the patient, often by balancing the humours. This might include the use of Galen's theory of opposites. They might also use bloodletting to balance the humours and by um, using blades and heated cups or even leeches to remove the blood, the blood. Phlebotomy charts were diagrams that helped doctors to bleed patients at the so-called correct locations. If you want to have more information on some of the uh, types of activities that I'm describing here, I've got separate videos on them. But let's have a look at some other natural treatments. It wasn't just physicians trying to treat patients. Apothecaries, they would mix up medicines for a price. They might produce medicines on the instructions of a physician, or they might just create their own. Most medicines tried to relieve the symptoms of illness, a little bit like the doctor's treatments. Some herbal remedies were actually effective for this, but apothecaries used more exotic ingredients in medicines called theriacas too. Others sought to balance the humours through purging or laxative effects. Also there were quacks, although I will point out that most of these travelling quacks came a little bit later in the late 16 and the 1700s. But these were travelling medicine salespeople, and at best they offered similar medicines to the apothecary. More often though they promoted panaceas, the idea of a cure-all, which were commonly fraudulent. Lastly there were the barber surgeons, not the same as treating an illness but still useful in the medieval period. These were semi-trained to provide basic external surgery, including tooth pulling, lancing boils and removing growths. However, a lack of anaesthetics and antiseptics made serious surgery like amputations possible, but incredibly dangerous. But we have to give special attention and an honourable mention to the home, because actually this is where the majority of healthcare took place. Women in the home were probably the healthcare that the vast majority of ordinary people experienced. Herbal and other remedies would have been learned by women and used in the home. Many of these would have been in, uh, of some use, proven by practice and experience. 
Local wise women and midwives might be able to provide more specialist treatments in the community. For example, most villages would have had a woman who was known to be able to deliver babies more safely. It is likely that that very minor surgery might have been done in the home too, though few records survive, probably as it was taken for granted that women were healers in the home, in keeping with their status in society. We're going to have a look at a nice source which expresses this idea. This is an extract from a letter by Margaret Paston to her husband John in 1464. The Pastons were a wealthy family and at this time John was in London. Margaret Paston writes, For God's sake beware of any medicine that you get from any physicians in London. I shall never trust them because of what happened to your father and your uncle, whose souls God forgive. Now, it's tantalising that we'll never really know what happened to the father and uncle mentioned within this letter, but it's clear that actually this couple, who would have been able to afford a physician at a time when many uh, wouldn't be able to, didn't actually trust their cures, which maybe speaks of the confidence that people had in them as healers. But more on that another time. It's important too to recognise the role of hospitals. This was one of care rather than cure. The word hospital itself comes from hospitality, the idea of looking after people. The first hospital in England was created in 1123 at St Bartholomew's in London, or at least the first one we have good records for. At first, hospitals were set up by monasteries run by monks who cared for older people. Between 30 and 60% of hospitals were run by the church in various medieval times. The focus was on caring for the sick, but not curing them. But the focus on comfort and hygiene could be helpful, and some recovered. This developed when new, smaller hospitals were set up by guilds and wealthy townspeople in more urban settings. These cared for local people and could be a privilege of guild membership for certain trades. By 1400, there were over 200 hospitals across the country. 100 years later, in 1500, there were 1,500 hospitals. And that's quite a neat thing to remember, if you remember that by the start of the Renaissance period in 1500, there were 1,500 hospitals. But there were some more specialist hospitals too particular Lazar or leper hospitals. Leprosy was a disfiguring and terrifying disease with no cure in medieval times. Lazar houses were run, up, run by the church, often by monks and nuns, and the patients who were less badly effective might help too. You can see to the right here a forensic archaeological reconstruction of a medieval leprosy sufferer. You can see that this poor person would have had pustules on their face, the tissues in around their eyes and their nose and their lips have broken down, providing them with a pretty terrifying appearance. Sadly, leprosy was considered the result of sin, and so these people were often seen as unclean and not allowed to enter the town. However, the Lazar hospitals provided some help. In these hospitals, leprosy sufferers lived in separate communities, away from towns and other people, as, like I've said, lepers were seen as unclean and being punished by God. There's a strong religious element to their treatment too. Here we see the combination of the natural and the supernatural treatments which went hand in hand in the Middle Ages so often. I've included at the bottom an old map, this time only really from the 1880s, of Taddyport near to Great Torrington in North Devon. Taddyport today is a very small village but it was originally founded as a leper hospital and you can see on this map it says the site of St Mary Magdalene's Hospital. Mary Magdalene was the patron saint of lepers, so it made sense that that was the dedication. The chapel is still there and would have originally served the religious needs of the leper community without them having to go to the parish church. The strip fields to the right of the map, they were given to the people so that they had something to eat. Some final points then. Medieval understanding of the cause of disease divided between the supernatural and the natural, and the treatments followed the same logic. Supernatural treatments included ones which were largely Christian in the British Isles, with prayer to saints associated with the diseases, also religious confession and pilgrimage. Natural treatments included, well, it depended what healing you could afford to see. And it was often based on ancient ideas such as the theory of the four humours and Galen's theory of opposites. Balancing humours, e.g. through bleeding and purging, and herbal medicines, more exotic attempts at cures such as theriacas. Hospitals operated on a basis of care and not cure. However, in most cases, treatments sought to relieve the symptoms rather than treat the underlying illness, which limited their effectiveness. Anyway, that's the end of this rapid revision video. I hope it's been useful to you, and if it has, please drop the video a like and subscribe to the channel for more. But for now, I'll say thanks very much and goodbye.